the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. There were two young men who came up to the Yukon during the first summer of the gold rush. One was Charles Edward Talbot from Beacon Hill in Boston, and the other was named Edward Lee Jordan, whose home was in New Orleans. They met for the first time in the 303, that wild and wide-open cafe Soapy Smith ran in Skagway. Eddie Jordan was sitting at a table with Slick Chalmers, and Talbot was standing at the bar only a few feet away. Slick was trying to sell Eddie a claim. You've heard of Bonanza Creek, haven't you? Why, sure. Well, that's where this claim is, and it's yours for $2,000. That's a lot of money. It's almost all I have. You ask anybody if it isn't a bargain. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Who are you? My name's Talbot. Why don't you mind your own business? I'm just trying to be helpful. You suggested that your friend ask anybody if a claim for $2,000 on the Bonanza wasn't a bargain. Why doesn't he ask me? Very well, sir. I am asking you. It is, sir. The name is Edward Lee Jordan, sir. All right. Mine is Charles Edward Talbot. My friends call me Chuck. They call me Eddie. Good. Claim on the Bonanza for $2,000 is practically stealing. I've got a friend who just came down from Dawson. He says that if you offered 100000 for a Bonanza claim, the owner would laugh at you. 100000 you all were willing to sell to me for only two slick? I told you how it is. I, I need the cash. I've got to get back to the States. Why, Slick? Have you pulled this trick too often? Are there enough suckers coming in? The late P.T. Barnum said there was one born every minute. Get out of here, Talbot. Sure. Just as soon as I finish my drink. Get out. Now, just a second, Slick. I'm not as stupid as I may seem. This gentleman here has given me a very timely warning. I consider it a friendly gesture. If you're going to get tough with him, you'll have to answer to me as well. Let's go, Eddie. This is his stamping ground. He's got a lot of friends around here. That's right, mister. And they don't like the way you queered my pitch any more than I do. Slug, come here. Bring the boys. Okay, Slick. Hey, Rue! Come on, Eddie. Hey, just a second. What's the trouble, Slick? The tall one told the rebel he couldn't buy a Bonanza claim for $100,000. Oh, interfering with your business, huh? Yeah. I guess you better dust him off a little. <laughs> sure thing. What's up, Slug? These two. The works before we toss them out. Ready, Eddie? I'm with you, Chuck. Come on, get us! <laughs> Soapy's strong arm squad closed in on Eddie and Chuck. The two young men were husky and did a good job of defending themselves. Still, there could be no chance of winning such a fight, and Chuck knew it. The only chance he and Eddie had was to win their way to the door before Slug and his men knocked them down and out. Suddenly, Chuck saw his opportunity. He was fighting with his back to the bar, and he saw that only Slug stood between him and the door at his right. He put all his power in one solid blow to the jaw. Slug grunted and staggered back. Chuck grabbed Eddie's arm. Come on, run. I'll show him. Chuck dragged Eddie with him as he ran for the door. They reached it. Chuck threw it open and thrust Eddie outside. Slug was on top of Chuck by that time. The younger man crashed another solid right to his jaw. The next second, he too was outside the cafe. Come on, run, Eddie. Around the corner of the building down the alley. They'll be coming after us. Slug and his men charged out of the cafe after Chuck and Eddie. But they reached the alley and back of the cafe, ahead of their pursuit. And then Chuck led the way between buildings, down one alley and up another, until the gang was lost. Finally, Chuck took Eddie to the cabin where he was living and gave him first aid for a bad cut below his eye. <laughs> It'll only sting for a minute. You're lucky it wasn't worse. <laughs> I know that. Do you know, we're not exactly safe in Skagway anymore. Soapy's men will be watching for us. Aren't there any police around? There's a town marshal. He takes his orders from Soapy. Well, I'm ready to leave Skagway right now. Same here. What about your supplies? I've already packed them up to the top of White Pass. 
I just came back to see if I could buy a canoe. I have a canoe waiting for me at Lake Bennett. Well, that's so? I'm traveling alone, Eddie. Say, it's a good idea to have a partner on the trail. What do you say? You come along with me. Oh, I'd like nothing better. <laughs> Let's shake it. <laughs> sure thing. Put her there, partner. Yeah. Most of my supplies are up at the top of the pass, too. Let's start tonight, Eddie. That's a good idea. I only have a few things to pack up here. We'll be over the border and on our way down to Lake Bennett before sunrise. <laughs> Dawson, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> and so Chuck and Eddie became partners. And during the next few days, they packed their supplies from the top of White Pass down to the shores of Lake Bennett. There, Chuck found the old sourdough who had agreed to sell him a canoe. The price was high, $500. But the craft was in good condition, and it meant saving the time it would take to build their own boat. The canoe was loaded, and the two young men set out in high spirits. They had no trouble in Lake Bennett or Tagish or Marsh, but when they reached the turbulent waters of the 50-mile river, they realized that they would have to pack their supplies around Miles Canyon in the White Horse Rapids. A canoe loaded high above the gunnels would have no chance of getting through without capsizing. The portage was made, and they returned to their fragile craft. What about it, Chuck? We could carry the canoe over the trail, you know. Yeah, it'll take us all day. We'll be in Lake Labarge in less than an hour. I don't know. That's mighty treacherous water in the canyon. The rapids beyond are even worse. Cold feet, Eddie? <laughs> Not exactly, but I've got a confession to make. I can't swim. You won't have to. Can you guarantee that? Why, sure. There's nothing to worry about. <laughs> all right, partner. I'll take your word for it. Climb in. <clears throat> all set? Set as I'll ever be. Here we go. They made the passage through the canyon safely, and then came a stretch of quiet water. But the White Horse Rapids beyond were different. Chuck found his strength wasn't up to controlling the canoe in the seething, madly racing stream. Time and again, the canoe grazed the black boulders that rose above the surface of the water. Time and again, the canoe shipped water and came close to capsizing. Chuck, hadn't y'all better head for shore? No chance of getting there. I've got to keep her out in the middle. There's a canoe behind us. The man in it doesn't seem to be having so much trouble. He's better than I am, that's all. Isn't far now. There's the opening of the lake. And just here, clear the rocks. Look out on the right. I see it. Hey, we hit. Eddie. What? Quick. Hand me your paddle. I lost mine. Here. Look out, though. That last big rock, you're heading straight toward it. I see it, I'm trying I'm going to hit again. Hang on a minute. The canoe rammed the rock with such force that a great hole was ripped in the side, and the canoe turned turtle. Both men were thrown into the water. Chuck. When Eddie rose to the surface, he was able to grasp the overturned craft, but Chuck's head had hit a smaller rock. Eddie saw him going under, unconscious, drowning. Eddie knew that he could only swim a few strokes, but he never hesitated. He let go of the canoe and splashed awkwardly to Chuck's side. He grabbed his shirt and then tried to get back to the canoe. But though the rapids were passed, the current was still fast, and the boat had drifted beyond his reach. Eddie struggled desperately. He could feel his strength going. He knew there was no chance for him to make the shore with Chuck, but he refused to let go of him. He must keep on fighting, fighting to stay above the surface of the water. There was help on the way. The man in the second canoe was Sergeant Preston, and with him was the great dog, King. The sergeant was off duty and out of uniform, on his way to the McQuiston River for a week of hunting. As his canoe swept past the rock that had capsized the partner's craft, he called to King. Hey, boy. I'm going to tie this line to your harness. You're going overboard with me. Now just keep swimming and stay close to me, boy. I'm going to have my hands full with those two men. If the canoe doesn't weigh much, it won't pull you downstream too fast. Now keep it close enough for me to reach, won't you, fella? There. All right, here we go. Come on, King. King followed his master into the water. The sergeant struck out for Eddie and Chuck, and in a moment had reached their side. Help! Help! I can't hold him up anymore. It's all right, I've got him. How about you? I don't know. Now look, just put your hand on my shoulder. All right. Easy does it. Trust your head. Keep your chin up. You stay afloat. Yeah, but how can you get to shore? King, come on. Come here, boy. King swam hard against the current when the sergeant called to him. And although he could make no real headway against it, he managed to hold his own. And the sergeant, with Chuck and Eddie, drifted down toward him. When I get to the canoe, grab hold of the side. All right. Good work, King. Can you hang on? Yes, I've got it. It'll only be for a few minutes. Come on, King. In the shore, boy. <laughs> 
The sergeant and King maneuvered the canoe out of the main current and into shallow water. The canoe was beached, and Chuck was carried ashore. For a desperate hour, the sergeant applied artificial respiration. At last... He's breathing. Yes, he'll be all right now. I have some blankets in my canoe. I'll wrap him up in them first, then I'll build a fire. The sergeant made camp for the two exhausted travelers. He cooked a meal for them. Then he paddled down to the lake and found their capsized canoe floating in the shallow waters. He pulled it ashore and carried it back to the campsite. He patched it. He accompanied Chuck and Eddie to the point where they had left their supplies. It was nearly evening when he said goodbye. I hope you won't have any bad luck from now on. I want to thank you, Preston. The words aren't enough. That's all right. In the canoe, King. Goodbye. Good luck again. Bye. I hope we'll meet again. Uh, talk about a good Samaritan. Yeah. He saved our lives. It's you who saved mine. <laughs> no. Preston told me what you did. Not being able to swim well and to... Uh, I'll never forget it, Eddie. <laughs> Come on, let's make camp. The sergeant was on vacation, and as a result, he hadn't mentioned his official position to the two men. That was why Eddie reached a strange conclusion concerning him. One doesn't ask a man like Preston questions. Questions? What sort of questions? Well, I suggested that if he stopped at the northwest mounted post at the top of the lake, they might pick up our canoe for us. Instead, he did it himself. <laughs> he laughed and said he had no intention of going anywhere near Northwest Mountain Post. You... You think that maybe Preston is... is wanted by the law? I only know what he said, but he isn't a prospector. He was only carrying a little food with him, some blankets. Just traveling light. Except for two pistols, a shotgun, and a rifle. Plenty of ammunition, too. Mm. Oh. Makes no difference to me. <laughs> Nor to me. I, I can't help feeling sorry to a great guy like that. Yeah, it's too bad. Well, this bacon's done. Let's eat. Six months passed before the sergeant saw Chuck and Eddie again. And once again, he was out of uniform. The reason this time was the intense cold. A steady, bitter 50 below zero. The clothes the Indians wore were the best for the trail. Caribou skin, a fur parka, and mucklucks. The sergeant was taking a big French-Canadian trapper named Andre Boudreau back to his cabin from the hospital in Dawson when they were overtaken by a blizzard. Unking! Unking! The storm she gets worse, sergeant. Yes. We'd better stop at the first cabin we see. How's the leg, Andre? Uh, it's not too bad. Why is Andre so stupid? Why cannot he set the leg straight? Most men wouldn't be able to set their own leg at all. Don't worry about it. The doctor's fixed it fine. I do not think we will get to Dawson for a long time. This snow will last for days. Even with King in the lead, it'll be impossible to travel. Look. What? I see a light. There's a cabin straight ahead of us on the left bank of the creek. Louis, it's good. Run, King! King and the dogs raced on toward the cabin. There was a shed beside it. And it was in front of this that King stopped. Oh, you have to be Oh, that dog is wonderful. He know that in weather like this, you will put the team inside, but not in the cabin where it would be too hot. He stopped in front of the shed. We'll make sure it's all right. Hello there. There is owner of cabin. Hello. Can you put us up for the night? Sure thing. Is it all right to put my team in the shed? Go ahead. It's unlocked. Let's lift the latch. All right. Sergeant unharnessed the team, led them into the shed and out of the fury of the storm. And after he had fed them, he and Andre and King fought their way through the blinding snow to the rear door of the cabin. Come on in. Hang your parkas up on the wall there. Well, you have quite a cabin here. Two rooms. Yes. <laughs> this is the kitchen. Ah, uh, you cook biscuits. It's Biscuits and beans. That's all I can offer you for supper. <laughs> you sound good, Andre. Say, I know you. Isn't your name Talbot? Yeah. We met on the White Horse Rapids last summer. Or I should say we met in them. Why, you're Preston. <laughs> I, I didn't recognize you. You recognize King, don't you? Of course. This is Andre Boudreau. Bonjour. Howdy. Oh, it's wonderful having you here. Having somebody to talk to. Where's your partner? 
I haven't any partner. Oh, really? You did last summer. Boy from New Orleans, Eddie Jordan. I haven't any partner now. Gentlemen, you're welcome. How are you, Preston? Jordan. Uh, why don't you come in here? You won't smell the biscuits burning. Huh. You'll be eating in here anyway. Come on. Why, uh... Go on. There isn't any place to sit down here. You'll be more comfortable in there. Supper will be ready in uh, just a few minutes. All right. Uh, it's good to see you, Preston. It'll be great to have somebody to talk to. This is Andre Bujo, Eddie. Bonsoir. Ah, it's a pleasure, sir. Sit down. Eddie, what's the matter? What's this about you and Chuck not being partners anymore? We aren't. We're just waiting for spring to wash out the rest of the gravel we've dug, and then we'll split up. We don't talk to each other anymore. I see. That way we don't fight. Well, what have you been fighting about? The Civil War? The War of Secession, sir. I stand corrected. Believe me, Preston, I, I prefer the company of a man who's wanted by the law to that of a mealy-mouthed Puritan. You understand that, don't you? You're perfectly welcome here. Even if... Uh, what makes you think I'm wanted by the law? Uh, I, I shouldn't have said that. It makes no difference. <laughs> Why, Eddie? Never mind, Andre. You're welcome to stay as long as you all want. I, I only wish I could offer you more hospitality, like we're right down to the bottom of the barrel when it comes to supplies. I, I should have gone to the post a long time ago, but naturally I couldn't trust that Yankee with our gold. You might have to put us up for over a week, Eddie. I think we're going to be snowbound. Over a week? That too long? No. Well, that is, do you have some supplies with you? I'm afraid we'll have to use yours. Oh. Well, we'll be on short rations, but you're welcome. It's about time somebody came out here and dished up this food. That's my job today. Supper will be on the table in a minute. You don't need any explanation of what's going on, do you, Andre? I know. It is the cabin fever. I have seen it happen often. Mm -hmm. Two men, partners, good friends, they spend the winter together. Nothing but snow and coal. So cold they cannot work most of the time. Nothing to do but look at each other's faces until they hate them. And then, 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 they, then they fight. And then they reach the stage these boys have. When they do not fight. When they do not even speak. <laughs> it is too bad. Chuck saved Eddie from being swindled down in Skagway. Eddie saved Chuck's life in the White Horse Rapids. Those are things neither of them can forget, Andre. They don't really hate each other. It would be impossible to persuade them that they don't. And it depends. I have an idea that might work. What? Well... <laughs> And he seems to think I'm wanted by the law. We, oui, I did not understand. I did not think I heard right. Well, I met them while I was on leave, and I told them I didn't want to have anything to do with the Northwest Mountain. Yeah, you make the joke. No, I simply told the truth. I was going hunting. But uh, maybe we can use the fact that they think I'm an outlaw. Uh, it's too much for me. I do not see how. Well, they're low on supplies, and we're in the middle of a blizzard. Andre, I'm going to be very tough before the evening's over. You must back me up. Whatever you say, Sergeant. Don't call me Sergeant. We, oui, I will try to remember. Here they come. Now, don't be surprised at anything I say. No. During supper, neither Chuck nor Eddie addressed a word to the other, but they were genuinely glad to see the Sergeant. He didn't respond to their conversation until Chuck brought up the subject of their first meeting. You know, Preston, we... Well, that is, uh, I had a funny idea about you last summer. Oh? <laughs> I guess it was that arsenal you were carrying in your canoe. I had an idea you might be wanted by the law. Did you hear that, Andre? We. Oui. And the southern boy has the same idea. I have heard what they said. Well, maybe I'd better set them straight. You mean we were... I was wrong? There was some other explanation for those guns? I carry guns because I use them, Jordan. Andre, how many men have I shot? How many? Oh, oh it's hard for me to count. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, my. Why the oh, my? Number five. That was bad one. That fellow they call Wolf. Huh? I don't remember him. No, that is what I say. There have been so many. How you expect me to count when you cannot even remember? Well, make a guess then. Huh? Uh, 200. <laughs> What's so funny? Uh, Why, well, naturally, you're... I'm what? Why... Uh, why, nothing. Nothing at all. Well, that's where you're wrong. I got along with people until they start interfering with my business. I don't like the way you two have been talking. 
Let's have no more of it, said understood? Answer me! Oh, yeah, 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 Chris. Sure, sure thing. The rest of the meal was eaten in silence. When the sergeant had finished, he pushed his plate away. That isn't enough food for a hungry man. Well, we don't have much. Uh, I'll do better tomorrow. I'll see that somebody does. What's the matter, King? Too hot for you in here? All right, I'll put you out in the shed. When I come back, I'm going to check over your supplies. What? You heard me. Come on, King. Outside, the blizzard had increased in fury. Some of the drifts were three and four feet deep. I was telling the truth. We are going to be snowbound, King. All right, in you go. I'll probably have to dig you out in the morning. Good night, boy. Sergeant returned to the house. He winked at Andre and stamped out into the kitchen without saying a word to Eddie and Chuck. But they followed him and watched him as he looked over their scanty stock of supplies. Mm Mm-hmm. About enough food here for a week. That's what I think. For three people, that is, not for four. For three people? That's what I said. And Andre and I will be here at least a week. That means one of you would better leave right away. What? I don't get you, Preston. Maybe this gun will help you understand. If there's enough food for three people, one of you has to go. Go where? Doesn't matter to me where you go. What's the matter with the trading post? It's only about ten miles. We have no dog team. We couldn't make it in this blizzard. What's all this talk about we? I said one of you had to go. <laughs> and what's so funny? Uh, you're not serious. This gun says I am. But it would be murder. I don't like that, Will. Neither do I. Now listen, there'll be no argument. You can decide which one of you is to go between yourselves, but you'd better do it fast. There are some cards out on the table. I could deal them hand of showdown. Oh, that's fast enough. Come on, move. The sergeant marshaled the two bewildered young men into the other room. They searched his face for some sign of relenting, but his expression never changed. And he held his gun ready as Andre dealt the cards, five to each partner. Take up your hand, Talbot. What have you got? Right. Three aces. Let's see. There. Hmm, good hand. Can you beat it, Eddie? All right. No, I can't. Then you're the one to leave. Get going. Wait. Can't he... Can't he wait until morning? What's the sense of that? Well, he'd have more chance. Storm won't let up by morning. It won't hurt to let him stay for the night. All right, I'm not unreasonable. Go on, the two of you better turn in. But... No more arguments. Come out in the kitchen, Andre. We'll have some more coffee. Oui. You, you have kept your word, Sergeant. You have been very tough. But still, I Look, do not I've see... I've already proved my point. Natos really hate each other. What is it you have there? The five cards Eddie didn't turn over. He told Chuck he couldn't beat his three aces. Look. Four queens. It is he who had the best hand. That's right, he won. He's deliberately taking Chuck's place. He would lay down his life for his friend. I'm going to show Chuck these cards in the morning just before Eddie starts out. Ah, oui, I understand now. There can be no hate in the face of such feeling. I'll tell them who I really am. We'll break out supplies from my sled, and then we'll have a celebration. It's a good idea. All right, let's go to bed. But the sergeant didn't allow for the thoughts in Chuck Talbot's mind. Eddie's a good kid. The trouble between us is mostly my fault. He saved my life back there in the White Horse Rapids. That's something I can't forget. I've got to take his place. There's a chance I could make it to the post. He never could. I'll wait till the others are sound asleep. And I'll go. No chance of getting Preston's gun away from him. No chance of taking his team. I make too much noise. No, I'll just slip out the door while the others are sleeping. It was after midnight when King awoke. In spite of the storm, his keen senses told him there was someone moving around outside the cabin, and he felt it his duty to investigate. Long ago, he had learned how a simple latch, such as the one on the shed door, could be lifted. First, he tried to lift it with his nose. It didn't work. Then he stood up with paws on the wall beside the door, and reaching over, tried to push up the latch with one of them. He succeeded, and as soon as the latch was lifted, the wind blew the door open. Dogs began to bark, but King silenced them with a growl. He ran outside and around the cabin to the front. A man was struggling down the trail. King recognized him. 
It was one of his master's friends. But what was he doing? Where was he going? King ran to the door of the cabin and scratched at it. He barked furiously. The sound was swallowed up by the storm. King decided to follow the man, and he started after him. When he saw him again through the driving snow, he kept his distance. During the whole of the next hour, the man covered less than a mile, and then he did something that King knew was wrong. He started wandering away from the drifted trail to the left. The man was staggering. King decided he must be led back to the trail, and he ran up to him. A wolf! Where's my knife? In the darkness, Chuck thought he was being attacked by a wolf. When King tried to take his pocket in his teeth and pull him back to the trail, Chuck lunged forward with his knife. The blade raked King's shoulder and the great dog leaped back. Why was his master's friend attacking him when he only wanted to help? The man staggered on, and then he fell. He tried to rise, but sank back into the snow. It was too much for King. It was a problem the sergeant must solve. King turned and ran back to the cabin. This time, he was not to be denied. He not only barked, he threw himself against the door time after time. At last, the sergeant heard him and opened the door. What is it, King? There's something wrong, for sure. Chuck, where's Chuck? What's that, Eddie? Chuck's gone. He isn't here. Is that what you're trying to tell me, King? It is for sure. See? He wants you to follow him. Just a minute till I get under my parker, boy. He's gone in my place. Yes, Eddie, just as you would have gone in his. But what are you doing? I thought you wanted one of us to go. I wanted both of you to come to your senses. What? Andre will explain. Ready, King? Go on, boy. King led his master down the trail to the place where Chuck had turned off and then on to the left through the drifts. Chuck would never have been found if it hadn't been for King. The snow had completely covered him. The sergeant brushed it aside and helped him to his feet. All right. Up you go. Sleep. Let me sleep. You can sleep when you get home, Chuck. Come on, walk. You've got to walk. Come on, King. Lead the way, boy. An hour later, Chuck was wrapped in blankets and sitting close to the stove. In one hand, he held a steaming cup of coffee, and in the other, the five cards that had been dealt to Eddie. Poor Queens. Isn't that just like a rebel? You'd think he'd know enough about poker to realize four queens beats three aces. <laughs> Listen, Yankee. The game of poker was invented in New Orleans. Well, and what was wrong with it? Didn't you read the cards? Are you blind? Let me answer that question. You've both been blind. How about it now? Can you see each other a little more clearly than you did yesterday afternoon? Well, that's the answer. All right. Thanks, Sergeant. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank King, Chuck. My experiment would have gotten out of hand if it hadn't been for him. I'm sorry I cut your shoulder, boy. You got to make allowances, King. He comes from Boston. You can't expect him to have as much sense as you have. No, wait a minute. I have waited long enough. Give me those cards, Chuck. Now the two of you shake hands. <laughs> Okay, Sergeant. Put it there, partner. <laughs> That's better. Well, King, this case is closed. Now, here's Sergeant Preston with a preview of our next adventure. The case of the Yellow Kitten. When King and I stopped at the cabin on the way to Selkirk to leave a yellow kitten for little Georgie Mello, I didn't expect to return to that cabin that very night on the trail of a pair of tough crooks. Little George and his kitten started an exciting adventure that took fast thinking on the part of both King and me. Be sure to listen to this exciting adventure Wednesday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Wednesday until September, when we shall resume our regular Monday, Wednesday, and Friday broadcasts. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck. Till next Wednesday.